Welcome back everyone. In this final video for this problem, we're going to try to find the intermediate fields in between Q adjoin the fourth root of 2i and Q. So in a previous video, we were able to find the Galois group of the extension and even all the subgroups and that's down here uh, in the bottom. That is the subgroup lattice for the Galois group. So the reason we wanted that subgroup lattice is so that we could use the fundamental theorem of Galois theory to draw the lattice of intermediate fields. And so what the theorem tells us is that we can take the subgroup lattice and make a copy of it and flip it upside down. And, of course, the group names are still there. Uh, but the idea is that this Galois correspondence gives you this inclusion reversing bijection. And so we know we can actually draw the intermediate fields. So we're going to need to go through, and uh, we'll see, we'll blow it up a little bit. We know that at the bottom, you'll get Q. And at the top, we're going to get Q adjoin the fourth root of 2 comma i. Now everywhere in between is going to correspond to the fixed points of the subgroup which label those dots. Of course they're they're upside down. Um, there are eight of those subgroups and so that seems like there's there's quite a bit of work and and the truth is well there is quite a bit of work. Um, we're going to want to do this for an example like this, we want to do it systematically. Uh, for much larger examples, uh, you might want to look for more theoretical <laughs> uh, ways of doing this. But um, for an example like this, uh, we're just going to try to brute force it. All right. And the way I'm going to set up my brute force to do it systematically is with a little table. So let's clean that up a little bit. And the way the table might look is like this. So I'm going to start by labeling the um, a basis for Q adjoin the fourth root of 2 comma I over Q. And you recall the way that we, we go about doing that is you can find a basis for, say, Q adjoin I, and that would be 1 comma I. So maybe we'll note that. So you could have 1 comma i as your basis. You also need a basis for q adjoin the fourth root of 2. And, um, well, q adjoin the fourth root of 2, we'll, we'll quickly write that over uh, here. q adjoin fourth root of 2 over q. A basis, well, you could have 1, and uh, let's just make life a little bit easier for me. Uh, call alpha the fourth root of two. So you could have one alpha, and then you're going to need alpha squared, and you're going to need alpha cubed. And then you can stop, because you remember a minimal polynomial for the fourth root of two was x to the fourth minus two. So it means we can always stop when we get to the, the fourth power. All right, don't need to put that in. So that would have been a basis. And you remember the rule was, if you're going to adjoin two elements, then you get a basis by just multiplying all basis elements with each other. So I had 1 and i, and then I have 1 alpha alpha squared alpha cubed, and I'll multiply 1 times 1 is 1, i times 1 is i, 1 times alpha is alpha, i times alpha is alpha i, and I keep going. I'll have alpha squared, alpha i, alpha cubed, alpha cubed i. Okay. All right, fine. So I won't need this. Now, on the left side, I'm going to index with the elements of G. And I'm going to ignore the um, I'm going to ignore the identity element. We know that's going to fix everything. So I have sigma, sigma squared, sigma cubed, tau, tau sigma, tau sigma squared, and tau sigma cubed. And now what I want to know is what each of the elements of the Galois group do to each of the basis elements. Because once I know what it does to the basis elements, I'll know what it does to everything. 
All right. So I'm going to do this for just a couple of these, and and then I'll show you how the, the chart completes. Um, so first, well, we know that all of these Galois automorphisms are going to fix one, because it's a rational number. So that I can fill in easily. And let's see, our sigma, it sent i to i. So that's, that's actually fixed, which means all powers of sigma will have to send i to i. Tau, on the other hand, sent i to negative i. And so if I apply a sigma, which fixes i, and then a tau, all of these are going to send i to negative i. Okay, what about alpha? Well, sigma sent alpha, which was, remember that's the fourth root of two, to fourth root of two i, or alpha i. So I can put that there. And let me now go sideways. Once I know where sigma sends i and alpha, because sigma is an automorphism, I also know where it sends alpha i. I just multiply. So I would just multiply the i and the alpha components, so i times alpha i, which would be minus alpha. Uh, to figure out where it sends alpha squared, well, I just have to square where it sends alpha. So alpha i squared, which will be negative alpha squared. Okay. Uh, oh, this is supposed to be, what is that? Alpha squared i, excuse me. All right, so then to get alpha squared i, I just multiply where it sends i and alpha squared. So that'll be negative alpha squared i. Okay, to get alpha cubed, I just cube alpha i. So that'll be negative alpha cubed i. And then to get alpha cubed i, I multiply where sigma sends alpha cubed and where it sends i, and that'll end up being alpha cubed. Okay, so the idea is I would then fill out the rest of that table. Uh, again, once you know where it sends i and alpha, it's pretty easy to fill it out. Fine. After I'd filled out that table, the next thing I'm going to do is look for what elements are fixed by each of these uh, automorphisms. So, for example, sigma, I can see it fixes 1. In fact, I know all of these are going to fix 1, so I could put that into the chart. Uh, fine. Let me do it. Uh, I is fixed by sigma. All right, now alpha is sent to alpha i, so it's definitely not fixing alpha. Um, and then I have alpha i going to minus alpha. Because these are different signs, this is not going to work out where I get any fixed points, but I'll show you one in a, a little bit where I do get a fixed point. Um, let's see, alpha squared goes to minus alpha squared, that's not fixed. Alpha squared i goes to minus alpha squared i, not fixed. Okay, and all these are are now not fixing. Um, okay, alpha cubed goes to negative alpha cubed i, but alpha cubed i goes to positive alpha cubed. Again, the signs are, are swapped. So in fact, the only thing, oops, we wrote sigma over there. We should have meant, we meant, meant, meant to write i. So the only thing that sigma is fixing is one and i. Okay, so, Oops. So we can fill out the rest of this chart and fill out these fixes. And let me show you how I, I did that. So again, down here, you can see there's my sigma and I did the one i. When you go to sigma squared, uh, one and i were fixed. Uh, but then also you can see the alpha squared was sent to alpha squared and the alpha squared i sent to alpha squared i. So we get some more things that are fixed. Um, alpha cubed, well, it actually fixes all the same things as sigma, 1 and i. And so if, for instance, say we wanted to know the fixed points of the group generated by sigma, we would just say, what are the things that are fixed by sigma, sigma squared, and sigma cubed? And we can just take the intersection, then, of these lists corresponding to sigma, sigma squared, and sigma cubed. And you'd see the only things that are fixed in all these lists are 1 and i. And so, well, 1, of course, is part of the rationals already. So the fixed will just be Q adjoin I. All right. Let me show you one that's a, a little more interesting. Um, let's go down to tau sigma. So with tau sigma, you can see that the 1 is fixed. Fine. We get the 1. The I is sent to minus I, so that's not fixed. Now you have the alpha being sent to minus alpha I. So alpha is not fixed. But you notice that the alpha i, which is pretty close to where the alpha was sent to, is sent to minus alpha. 
And so in fact, if we add these uh, to get, or actually subtract these. So if I take alpha minus alpha i, and I apply tau sigma to it, well, it's going to send alpha, alpha goes to minus alpha i, which is the other side of this, and alpha i is sent to minus alpha, but because there's a minus, it becomes a plus alpha. We'll rewrite it, alpha minus alpha i. So actually, alpha minus alpha i is fixed, even though individually neither alpha nor alpha i are fixed. So that's how I ended up getting this alpha minus alpha i. Um, you'll also note alpha squared i is fixed. Okay, you can see that here. And then you actually have the same, uh, or at least a similar thing going on with alpha cubed and alpha cubed i. Alpha cubed is sent to alpha cubed i. Alpha cubed i is sent to alpha cubed. They have the same sign, so that tells you something good is going to happen. And, um, and so their sum is actually going to be fixed. Okay. So that means that all four of these are fixed. Now, when I go to do the fix of tau sigma, you'll see I actually don't put all four of them in there, and why not? Well, the reason why is because I went through and started checking some things. For instance, what if I took my alpha minus alpha i and I squared it? Well, you get alpha squared minus 2 alpha squared i minus alpha squared. Remember that i squared is minus 1. Okay, alpha squared minus alpha squared is 0, so I get minus 2 alpha squared i. And, well, that minus 2 I can ignore because it's just a rational number. That actually gives me the alpha squared i. So having alpha minus alpha i already gives me alpha squared i. I don't need to put it in. And similarly, if I cube alpha minus alpha i, I'll get some rational multiple of alpha cubed plus alpha cubed i. So I don't need that either. So in fact, I only need to adjoin alpha minus alpha i to q. So uh, you should look through the rest of this table. Uh, make sure you can replicate it. Uh, probably the most difficult thing is to recognize when you have these uh, sums uh, together. Um, uh, maybe another way you could think about doing that is the following. Um, so if we go back to the way in class we, we wrote these things down. So uh, once I have that basis, I know I could write an element as A plus BI plus C alpha plus D alpha I plus E alpha squared, plus F alpha squared I, plus G alpha cubed, plus H alpha cubed I. Okay, you can see why I've actually avoided writing it out in this form, because it's very, very long. Now, the table above tells us this is going to equal, all right, well, A. Now, what happens to the I? It gets sent to minus I, so this is minus B I. And you can see already why the B has to be 0, right? You have b equals minus b. So that tells you b equals 0. Okay, then what happens to c alpha? Well, it actually will go, you see up here, to minus c alpha i, which let me write it on under the alpha i section. So minus c alpha i. And then what about uh, alpha i? Well, that's sent to minus alpha, so you would get minus d alpha. So if we combine these two, we see that C has to be minus D, and that D has to be minus C. Okay, so that, of course, well, the second one doesn't tell you anything new, but um, if I say C is minus D and D is minus C, then what does the original C alpha plus D alpha I have to look like? it has to look like, well, I can replace the D with a minus C. So I get C alpha minus C alpha I, which I can factor as C times alpha minus alpha I. All right. So when I would write that original element, I actually won't need both an alpha and an alpha I, I just need an alpha minus alpha I, which is exactly what we were seeing up here. All right, so have fun, look at this table, play around with it, see if you can finish it off yourself.